these notions that they had around transhumanism, which basically is kind of that early exploration of this notion of I am robot and how the human body and technology will evolve over time. Absolutely. Like, I think what they really put forward was this idea of the body and technology merging, that they weren't, in fact, in conflict with each other. They could coexist. My name's Lisa Catt and I'm the Assistant Curator of International Art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And today I'm here at our collection storage facility with my colleague Asti Shering, our time-based art conservator. And we're really excited to show you some artworks that we have in our collection by the Korean-American artist Nam Joon Pike. Now Nam Joon Pike was a pioneer of video art and really put forward new ideas and experimental ideas around using technology and art. And so we want to discuss today what it means to make art from technology, what it means to collect art made out of technology, and what are the future implications of this. So I get to start us off um, with looking at the first artwork, which is uh, titled TV Buddha. Well, what an excellent array of obsolete technology we have here. What you see when you look at the installation is that we have a sculpture of Buddha facing the JVC television. And behind that, we have a closed circuit feed camera that is projecting onto Buddha and creating this beautiful instantaneous feedback loop of Buddha reflecting at his own gaze. So what we have is the 1976 Philips video camera that was the original camera used up until 2016 when this object ceased to function. The decision was made at the time that we would use replacement as a strategy for the future life of this video sculpture. And so you see that this alternative was obtained and replaced and is still functional. So to have the conservation perspective of keeping something as it originally was is really limiting the lifespan of the object. What we do in time-based art conservation is we take this notion of active conservation and how our preservation and display strategies really revolve around variability, malleability, and the notion of change. So Pike was fascinated by the relationship between humans and technology the way that we interacted with technology and could interact with technology. And he was really prescient in the ideas that he had around what this relationship looked like. So in 1974, he declared that we were all on this electronic superhighway where we would be connected across the globe by open access to information and knowledge, which considering the internet didn't become public for another 20 years, was a pretty spot on prediction of the future. One thing that happened in 1965, which was really to change the course of art making in the 1960s, was that the Sony Porter Pack was introduced to the consumer market. And Pike was one of the first artists to start using this. The thing with the Sony Porter Pack was that it was portable, it was mobile. So basically, anyone could become the TV studio and they could distribute and produce their own images. So as we can see, Pike was really interested by the TV as this 20th century cultural icon and what the future may hold for our relationship with the screen and with technology. We see this also in his slightly later work, Buddha Game, which we see here partially cratered. If we look inside the work, we see the Buddha sculptures inside of the TV screen, watching miniature TV screens. And he had a real interest in fusing Eastern and Western philosophies. So here we see the idea of meditation within Zen Buddhism and this act of watching the TV in that American context come together. We're going to look at another work now, which holds a very special place in the gallery's history. So this is a partially uncreated TV cello. What we're looking at are three naked CRTs. They have been removed from their out of shell so it doesn't look like how your Nana's TV would have looked in her 1960s living room. And so we haven't set it up completely, but what you see here is the Perspex sculpture that creates the cello structure. So here, if we run down, this is the area where the keys go, 
And then here are where the bass strings run down the entire body of the work so it can actually be played by someone. And that's the thing, like it was originally a performance work. So in 1976, uh, John Caldor invited Nam June Pike and his long-term collaborator, Charlotte Mormon, to come to Sydney and then to Adelaide to perform a series of new works. And one of these works was TV Cello. And we have this great imagery from 1976 of Charlotte Mormon in the gallery's vestibule, playing this to like a really engaged group of people. There are school kids, there are adults, and everyone is gathered around tightly watching her because you, it was quite the spectacle. And this wasn't just the only performance she did. She also did other performances outside the Sydney Opera House where she was playing her actual cello and was suspended in the air by these bright, big helium balloons. She also climbed up onto the Art Gallery of New South yeah. Wales roof and dangled her cello off uh, the side in front of our facade. So as a performer, she was really provocative. She was really collaborative. And she was interested again in this idea of art and music and performance coming together. One of the things I love when you see that archival footage of the 1976 performance in the vestibule is actually Pike is quite off to the side. He's hidden behind his Sony Porter pack and he's again gone back to that original feedback loop. So he's shooting her as she's playing this cello, like with what looks to be this incredible amount of physicality. I also personally love being a little bit of a, you know, technologist. These notions that they had around transhumanism, which basically is kind of that early exploration of this notion of I am robot and how the human body and technology will evolve over time. Absolutely. Like I think what they really put forward was this idea of the body and technology merging, that they weren't in fact in conflict with each other, that they could coexist. So this isn't the only TV cello that exists in the world. There are actually 19 different TV cello sculptures in various private and public collection that we've found. All oh, right, <laughs> so there could be more. <laughs> and four of which were performed by Charlotte Mormon. In our research, when we've gone to other collections in the world, one particular example that really resonated with me was the Walker Arts Centre. The Walker Arts Centre have chosen to display their work as evidence of a performance that has just occurred. And when I say that, I mean they have their TV cello, they have Charlotte Mormon's stool and her bows beautifully sitting across the stool with this idea that she's just simply got up and walked away from the performance. So now we're gonna take a look at the inner workings of this sculpture and really uncover the different layers of technology that has accumulated almost like an archive inside the plinth of this sculpture. So this is the base of TV Cello. When we open it, there's an inscription. Pike TV Cello built April 1976 at Paddington Video Access. So what we're looking at here is an evolution of technology that has been occurring since 1976. So not only has the sculpture itself gone under myriads of change, but the playback technology has had to shift as media has become obsolescent and changed over time. So for me, it's just such a perfect little picture of the complexities of an object like TV cello. So I think it's fascinating to see how much change can occur within our lifetime. But when talking about a museum collection, of course, it extends far beyond that. And the future is wild when it comes to this artwork. The amount of change it's undergone in the last 40 years, we can only begin to imagine what the future will bring.